Welcome everyone to the Black Prospector podcast show. And in this particular episode, because we talk about black unapologetic masculinity, particularly family, fatherhood, leading your children, but also getting your mind, your body in shape. And of course, we talk about social and political issues as well when they happen to come up. We're certainly not shy when it comes to dealing with those issues. So in this particular show, while we're talking about the automotive industry, uh, I'm going to end up asking a question about Japanese car manufacturers and the fact that in the Midwest of the United States, the general buyers tend to not prefer to buy Japanese cars. They prefer American. Now, since I'm talking about where the audience or shall I say the panel that I'm with, we all are from the Detroit area. We're specifically talking about when we grew up, the black people that lived in Detroit preferred to buy domestic over the Asian manufacturers. Now, when I asked that question, I was not asking it because now we're living in this environment of uh, we have this so-called stop Asian hate. That was not why I was asking the question. And I just want to be clear on that before we start the show. The reason why I was asking the question and I have my reasons uh, that you hear during the show, but I also tell you, you know, kind of my hypothesis behind all of that is just also because of, if anything, the Asian hate was something that has always been really propped up by the dominant society. In other words, it has been generally the belief of the people in the United States that have not been black that have seemed to really fan the flames of Asian hate. As someone who owned a 1992 Honda Civic, or actually at the time, uh, my then girlfriend bought the car and we were warned that the car could be keyed, the car could be you know, damaged and vandalized in some way because it was a Japanese car. Well, that wasn't going to be done by anyone black. And so I just want to be clear when I asked that question, it certainly was not to kind of, you know, piggyback on what is being talked about in the media today. That was not really the impetus behind the question. And so I think that needs to be said these days because there's this I don't agree with the narrative. I am really, as you even hear me say during the show, I speculate that a lot of these um, all of a sudden Asian violence that's going on that we're seeing. I wonder, as you already know, I do not believe in an accidental history. Uh, I think that when we have people all of a sudden and, you know, I've been black all my life for over a half century now. And so all of a sudden we have this black on Asian violence and I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it one bit because I've never heard about it. And certainly in the Detroit area, it was something that was never discussed, talked about. There are no Asian pejoratives in the black community except for one, which is not unique to the black community. And you hear me bring it up in the show. That is the term rice. Now, I will even tell you how I stand on that. So there is no confusion. For many years, actually, I will go back as far as to say for almost a couple of decades, I have always championed against using the term rice because and and you can go. I, I can give you references. I'll put it like that. You know how white people say, hey, my best friend is black. Well, let me talk to that best black friend then. So I can give you references of people that I have actually pointed out. I'm not fond of using that term rice. Because I always flip it around. I would not want an Asian person nor a white person to look at a Cadillac and call that man. You know, yeah, he got it watermeloned out. <laughs> he got it ribbed out. I don't like those kind of phrases being used toward my community. And I don't think they should be used toward anyone else's community. And so uh, that's a term I've always fought back without even having so-called Asian friends. It's just because I view it as the right thing to do. Now, if anything, and for those in the audience who may be of the Asian community, I would ask, do you do the same thing when people from your community make comments and use terms about black people? If you hear the so-called N word, do you call out anyone in your community that may use that phrase? I would say this even to my so-called white friends or white people. Because even if you feel the word is wrong and based on the discussions that I've always had with people, they can even say, well, I, I don't use the word, you know, like kind of like Mark Furman during the O.J. Simpson trial. Well, I don't I don't know. I don't use the word. I mean, okay, I may have used it once. Well, people who say I don't use the word 
are often quick to point out, but yeah, I do have some family members that do it. Or my dad, you know, he's used it before. I've heard people use it. But then my question is, what do you say to them when they use it? Do you check them on using that word? Because I'll tell you, even my grandfather who fought on Okinawa Island in World War II, I remember speaking against my grandfather because he used the term Jap. And I said, Granddaddy, I don't know if that's really the proper term that we should be using. Now, of course, I look back at that. I was a young man. And I look back at that, and you know, I could say, I could, I could say I understand because my grandfather was in a war and he was taught to basically hate a certain group of people. I would probably argue that one of the reasons why we have many of the wars we do is also kind of a, a law of unintended consequence, but they know what they intend to do is to kind of also in, uh, uh, get us to hate a particular group of people that those at the top are actually friends with. But. I digress, but even saying that to my older grandfather, uh, I was brave enough to even say, I don't think you should be calling them that. So I would ask you, for those who feel that there's so much black on Asian hate these days, do you do the same in your community when someone says something really disper discouraging against black people? You also hear comes up Latasha Harlins, and it's really good that I bring this up and I just want to point this out, that Latasha Harlan's, if you remember that name, as Tupac says in his song, because a bottle of juice is nothing to die for. I, I didn't take the time to go into it because we were heavy in the conversation about cars. But, you know, Latasha Harlan's was killed. Uh, a young girl was killed in a store. It was a South Korean store owner. And I think it was allegedly over stealing a bottle of juice. And what really made bl the black community so outraged, and I'm in the Midwest, so I didn't even hear about this case that much out there until later, actually through Tupac. And also when you had the um, uprising take place after the Rodney King verdict. And as many historians now look back and see what really primed the pump, it wasn't that people went to the streets just over Rodney King. It was because that South Korean store owner got off with probation because see black folks understood that, you know, whether there's so-called hate against any group, Asian hate, white hate, black hate, whatever, there's really only one hate that you can walk away from and not spend the rest of your life in jail or not even, it may not even cost you your life. And that's black hate. So here it is. We fast forward all these years later and we watch police officer at police off after police officer get acquitted. That's where black people really tend to shout, as the late Ralph Wiley said, because we watch so-called black hate and we watch people never go to prison. We watch people get probation. We watch people get fired, get rehired. We watch people get administrative duty. But we rarely see people go to prison. But yet when we talk about Asian hate, or we talk about any other form of hatred against any other group, so-called minority group, we watch le legislation get passed. We watch people go to jail. We watch money <laughs> get put on the table to help with the problem. So I just want to point that out of the differences and want to point that out before anyone comments that, well, you know, I, I heard on your show, they talked about, you know, using the term ricer and they talked about, uh, see, no, it, it, I can tell you for me, Dev Tumbleweed, that's never been anything that, that I've endorsed. And I've called people out and I just ask that you do the same. I hope you do the same. I hope when, whether for my Asian brothers and sisters out there, that when your community uses and says comments against the black community that you check them on that that you educate them on the history that I'm, I'm going to assume you know right and i'm going to ask the same thing of those in the white community that even though you say well i don't use the n-word or i don't you know talk about black people that way especially for you my my liberal white brothers and sisters the ones that are so-called woke that you know are down with black lives matter and all that uh i hope that you do the same thing that when you're at that dinner table and when, you know, maybe that one relative that you always talk about is such a big Trump supporter and makes comments that you don't just sit there and you don't rationalize like I could have done with my grandfather. 
and say, well, but you know, I understand granddad's just from a different time. My dad's from a different time where they talked like that about black people. So I, I get it. I understand. I don't think it's right. I choose not to do it, but I, I understand why he does it. So, you know, I just don't like it. It makes me a little uncomfortable because then I guess it all goes back to what Martin Luther King said in letters from a Birmingham jail. You know, the problem with the white evangelical preachers was the fact that they sat around silently and didn't say anything. So. I always say something and I'm going to encourage you to do so. So let's go ahead. Let's talk about some cars. But I just wanted to come with that intro first. So you always know how we roll in here on the Black Prospector Show, whether we roll in talking about cars, because at the end of the day, we're always talking about black issues and how it relates to the black community. And so I just wanted to make that well known. So without any further ado, let's get with it. Welcome, everybody, to the Black Prospector Show. Everybody get comfortable because we're going to take a ride. We got my man Kev already up in the ride to take us somewhere. <laughs> so we are going to take a ride today talking about cars. And, and you know, I hope you all understand we are, I'm, I'm slightly rebranding the show because we've talked about music. You know, we love talking about relationships uh, and we always going to talk about black issues and keep it black. I mean, that's the main reason I'm doing this. And today we haven't had a dedicated show on the automobile industry. One thing I've learned over the years is that black people, the black community sets the trend when it comes to the cars that are out there. And we're gonna to touch more on that later on, but I wanted to be a regular part of the Black Prospector Show. And the guys that I have joining me today, they know how to bring it. Now, first of all, let me say to everyone, we do not represent the companies that we work for. We doing <laughs> our own thing today. That's what this is all about. We, we have all have our work personas, and now today, and every black person watching this right now knows what I'm talking about. We all have our, hey guys, how you doing? That's awesome. Right. What up, man? You know, we all have that, right. that side. Right. So today we on yep. the what up side. You know, you know how when you ask what up and you don't expect an answer, that's the yes. side. When we don't hear of what up, oh, there's nothing. No, we're not on that side today. So <laughs> we just gonna be ourselves and we're gonna be ourselves talking about automobiles, the car industry, how it relates to black folks. Cause I wanna include that in there. And so again, what we have to say is our own opinion, not that for the companies that we work for. So with that, I just want to go around and I go how it appears on my screen. If you guys can just give a quick introduction of yourselves and, uh, you know, I'm going to say, give me a quick introduction and tell me what's the first car you owned that you love the most. Well, no, we don't even say love the most. Let's just say the first <laughs> ride that you own. We get to love later on. Just the first <laughs> ride that you remember really driving. That's that's your car, not your mom and daddy's car. The first car you drove. Because here's a key difference. The first car that you drove. That if you would have gotten to an accident, all your daddy would have said is, "It's yours. Tear it up." <laughs> <'Cause there's a laughs> <difference. laughs> so, right. Aaron, starting with you on how you appear. We go, Aaron, Dwayne, and Kevin, and then we'll come back around. Okay. Yes, my name is Aaron uh, Mickles. As my family called me, Aaron with a hard A. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I currently reside in Virginia. Um, see, my car, my first car. I think my first car was that I actually bought outright myself was the '87 Chrysler Fifth Avenue. Uh, yeah, yeah, Chrysler <clears throat> Fifth Avenue. It was actually one you know my dad picked up in Michigan when I was in the Marine Corps. <clears throat> And I came up and, and picked it up from him. Uh, but he got it for me, um, paid him for it. And that was my first car. I like that car too. Man, I like that car. Cool, cool fact, I actually got into an accident like the like the first weekend I got it, first couple of days I got it down in, in Detroit. I went up to Selfridge Air, Air Force Base to do something for the military. And coming back through Michigan, it wasn't a bad accident, but I rear-ended a lady in a in like a Taurus or something. And, and you know the, the Fifth Avenues, they had that you know the rubber and the, mm -hmm. the front end of the mm -hmm. flimsy right above the bumper, and so from that point on, I just got it, and I had put a put a chip chip the grill and pushed it in a little bit, but I still rode it for the next you know I don't know three or four years with it like that. And yeah, that was my first car. Your old man didn't get on you, right? I I, I mean I paid for it, so <laughs> right. <laughs> there it is. Wasn't much you can say. Hmm. <laughs> All right, Dwayne, how about you? So the first one I got that was actually my own was a 1993 brand new uh, Chevy Cavalier. 
Um, I really wanted the, what was it at that time, the Z24, but I just Z24, could not, yeah. yep, I just could not make the payment work. And um, uh, this one was neat because it was a manual <clears throat> when they actually still made manuals. And what was also neat about it, it had all the features I wanted on it. It had, um, actually it was two door, it had power windows, power door locks, air condition, which again, that's when air condition was still, you could still get a car without air condition. But here was the best part. It did not have a radio and it didn't, um, oh, something else it didn't have. So a friend of mine that I had gone to Michigan State with, he had recently graduated. He was working at the Chevy dealer at the time. And he rode with me in the car while I was test driving it to a stereo place. And I was able to get the stereo speakers I wanted, the alarm system. It had a, like a pull-off face and everything like that. And you couldn't tell me anything. And uh, um, I, I, it, that was probably, that was the first new car I bought. It was the first car that I got on my own. And that little bit of customization made all the difference. Cause I, like I said, I had the sound system and everything else like exactly where I wanted it. And he helped me roll it right into the price of the car. So I'm uh, probably not the wisest uh, financial decision, but um, it made it all like clean and, and crisp. And like I said, you couldn't tell me nothing. All right, hold on. What did you say it was? I was typing errands in there. So yeah, it was a 1993 Chevy Cavalier. And it was a, a burgundy two-door coupe. Yeah, that's my baby right there. Look at her. <laughs> <laughs> burgundy, and mine was like this one that? that you see over towards the that one. That burgundy one right there. In the oh, middle. Right and yep, that was it. <laughs> now you know we, we got actually, some fans. Yeah, I yeah. um like I, I said, uh, I only actually, for a couple reasons, I actually only ended up keeping it for about two years. Mm. But what happened is um, I had gotten, I recently graduated, so I got a lot of incentives. And my grandfather was a GM retiree, so I got discounts. And I actually sold the car for more than I paid for it, um, right. which was kind of interesting. Um, I sold it to, we needed to do something with our cars at the time, and my wife couldn't drive a stick. And... Um, we, we actually had the same car. She had a red one. It was a manual. I had the, this other one. We decided to sell it. And the young man who bought it, he saw it, like he looked at it, saw it was a stick, saw it had the nice stereo system. His grandparents were buying it for him. They didn't even try to negotiate. He just went wow. for it. So wow. I actually, it's, it's very rare that you can actually end up <laughs> selling a car for more than what you paid right. for it. For real. Although with the way the used car market is acting right now. Hey, exactly. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk that's, about that a little bit in a second. I was going to say, that's like a whole show in and of, us, in yes. and of itself. Yeah. Yes. All right, Kev, what about you? Oh, my goodness. Come on, man. What wasn't that long. My man. first car. <laughs> yeah, right. First car that you bought. My first car that I bought was a 1972 Mercury Comet oh, GT, baby. Thank you. I can look this up. <laughs> <laughs> the red one, huh? Not a Maverick. Yeah. Not a Maverick. Y'all better recognize. Ah, I remember nice. that one. Exactly. Hold on, y'all. Everybody be quiet because we can watch them cry. Because <laughs> 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 he's going to shed some tears looking at this one. <laughs> he's going to shed That's how she looked. That's how she looked. Ooh. Oh. oh, my goodness. <laughs> he goes there some tears. Oh, uh, <laughs> hold on now. Can 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 I wax poetic about your car? Yes. Let me tell y'all. I was there <laughs> when he bought the car. <laughs> he rolling down the highway, and there's this red, rusted out, raggedy Ford. But then. We look at it, you see the picture scrolling by from the Mecham auction there. That wasn't it, but his wasn't not nearly that good. His was rusted out all over the place, but the engine was absolutely amazing. So guy cranks it up, Kev takes it for a test drive, comes back cheesing and grinning. He buys it, we go ahead and go back to the place. That car, as rusted out as it was. Now, mind y'all, at the time, Mustangs were pretty much the king of street racing. They were, yeah. you know, you Grand Nationals were doing their thing. I mean, that was really the king, but who had yeah. a Grand National who could afford one? Right, right. It was all about the Fox body Mustangs, the five O's. 
Kev will roll up with, <laughs> we'll be in those seats sliding all over the place. <laughs> Kev will roll up. And it was no, he would jump out on Stang so tough. It would, the only way they would be able to catch him would be if they were pulling deep in the third gear. And right. you know, probably Rust was falling off the car. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> but the car was amazing. Everybody, it was, it was almost, what's that show, Street Outlaws, where they now want, um, with the, what, the farm truck or whatever? It was almost like that was how that was how the comic was. It was when you raced that car and when you was in it, and what it had that shift kit in there too. So when the trans yeah. shift, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> sounded amazing. Mm-hmm. I, so I got to brag on your ride yeah. on that one, and that I'm glad we found <laughs> on a red one at that. And no, yeah, once exactly, it, it was not a Maverick because <laughs> you're <laughs> had to call the Maverick. Got to be clear, it was not a Maverick. <laughs> well, I, all right, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I, I had to share my my lovely experiences with that car. Yeah. Nice, hey, I, I like that. Enjoyed that car myself. Got it um, seven hundred bucks. Seven hundred and drove it. Wow. Seven hundred and drove the wheels off of it. Wow, man. Yeah. Yes, that was a true born find. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Mine, I think I put it up on in one of our other shows where I ended up having, um, I bought a 1991 S10 in January of 1990. So you couldn't tell me nothing because I bought a truck that wasn't out yet. And, um, you know, I was, I was mighty proud of it. At that time, trucks were just getting hot. That's and, right. you know, went and had some rims put on it. Had I remember going in there like a big idiot and I said to the guy, I was like, all I want is a cassette. Now, you know, I mean, come on, y'all, don't hate on me. It was a cassette. That was, that's what <laughs> yep. right. So, you know, it was it was similar to this one. The only difference was it was white. And, you know, it had the, the grill. I'm trying to see the bar. The grill on it was unique for 91. That was really the big difference. Yeah, it was the like black, this grill. Yeah. The black grill, yeah. Yep. And it was black. I mean, it was white, had the black grill, had some black wheels, and then I put my own wheels on there. And it was a hot little truck. It was so hot. That's why. Specific why I... now. Huh? Those were the deep dish. Be specific. Oh, Those yeah. Those were the big AMC stars, baby. AMC. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes, sir. So, so the thing was, you know, with that truck, it was so hot. That's why they stole it twice. And <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson. Which I'm going to lead that right into our topics today because, uh, you know, they stole it twice. It, it, I lived in Detroit and it got taken. It was funny because I always look back at it. That was when carjacking was really something that was taken mm-hmm. off yep. in, a, in a bad way. No pun intended. Yep. And, um, yeah. you know, I look back at that time. It was like, man, nobody wanted to lose their life over a ride. Nope. But yeah, right. I will say that my buying patterns after that experience, it even made me conscious of the kind of cars that I picked out for myself yep. that I would buy because this is what I think is unique to the black community and, and and let's tell the truth, shame the devil. But we actually have to think when we go to that car lot, Correct. you gonna wanna steal this? Yeah. Go, What's the insurance <laughs> cost on this? And yep. I know that my white counterparts didn't have to have that same thought process. They could go buy a car and it's like, oh yeah, I wanna buy this such and such and they just go get it. We yep. had that extra element to think about. So, um, you know, and that's why I wanna do this as we talk about cars, just try to still keep it kind of from that you know, what will we tell our relatives and, and others when we talk about the car buying market or the car market when they're <clears> looking <throat> for a vehicle or some of our thoughts just kind of weave in on really what it's like in that unique black ownership yeah. experience yeah. as well. Well, even you bring that up, Dev, I remember probably post having kids, the car that my dad bought that was the most impressive. Um, he had a Pontiac Grand Prix DT. I don't know if you ever saw that car or especially saw it when he got it new. Uh, it was uh, like a 90, I'm going to go with like maybe a 94 or 94, 95. It was all black, had the gold, like BBS looking wheels. Mm-hmm. They had just the, the and, thin light, the thin lights in front. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I know you're yeah, talking about that. Um, that yeah. was, uh, and my dad has always been great about letting me drive, um, cars that he had or he'd rent cars and like hey take the keys drive it and I remember like you said carjacking had become a big thing and I was I was you know I was 
windows down, music up kind of thing. But look at every which every stoplight I stopped at, I'm looking left and right um, just just to make sure. Um, or you pull up to a stoplight a certain way, like I can't pin myself in between two vehicles in a certain way. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Well, it depends what time of night it is, whether you stop or exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, seriously. It's like you, you have that choice. You're like, yeah. do I stop? Or like, do I do I rather run into some the, the barrel of a gun of somebody who's yeah. gonna try to jack me or deal yeah. with the police at a in a traffic situation? Yeah. So it's it's it was a catch-22. A lot of consider like Dev to your point, a lot of considerations that others did not have to take into account. Yeah. No, I think it, it depends I mean, on where you live too. Yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, where I live, I really wouldn't worry about that right now. I live, you know, in the country, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, like, well, exactly. So it's, it's not, it's a lot less crime, you know, it's, uh, um, you don't have as much, you know, car thefts and things like that, you know? So yep. it all depends on, on where you live. And, you know, I hate to say it, whenever you're in a, a, a higher crime inner city, you're gonna, you're gonna have to be, you know, mindful of those things. Yep. Nope. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's funny is the first thing I started doing back during those times, I if I saw that the light was red, I didn't speed up to the light. I just right, right. Ahead, coasted up to the light. All of a sudden, what, 15 years later, when the recession hit in 07, they came out with this term called hypermiling of how you can maximize. I'm like, I've been doing well, that yeah, for I almost 20 years. Right. Exactly. <laughs> what am I speeding up to the life? I don't want to stop. <laughs> Get next <Yeah>. to somebody. <laughs> so, Hilarious. <laughs> all right, y'all. So let's get it started. Let's get it started. We got a lot of topics we're going to go over today, y'all. So we're going to talk about some new cars. You already heard. We're going to jump back and forth on some stuff we used to drive, our experiences. But really kind of the whole impetus behind the show came when Dwayne hit me up and had a driving experience in a Nissan Rogue. Now I know this brother know his cars. Some people when they call and you know they tell me about their car experience and stuff, it's like, oh, you know, okay, they don't know any better. But I know these guys, when they have an opinion on a ride, they have an opinion and I know it's valid. So man, you didn't get a chance to tell me the whole scoop. So now. Yeah, absolutely. What was it? What do yep. you think of the new yeah, so, Nissan Rogue? Yeah, actually. So I um so one of the car that I have now, my everyday driver, is a 2017 Fiat Spider Abarth. It is not a very practical car uh, for a lot of reasons, but it's a fun car. I got it brand new. Dev kind of knows the story of how I came about it. So oftentimes, depending on what I need to do and different things of that nature, I rent cars and I get a good discount with Hertz through my employer. Um, shout out to Hertz for actually having a pretty good business model. Um, I, I am a big uh, fan of theirs. So um, as you all know, not only is it difficult finding new cars, it's difficult finding rental cars. Uh, two of my sons were in town this week. So I thought, you know, so they can get around, they flew in, they, they're used to being independent now. Um, I'll rent a car for them so they could kind of have some flexibility. Um, couldn't be picky. I got, it was a 2020 Nissan Rogue. So I see you're showing a 2021. Um, oh, here's cool. what, and Dev and I have talked about this quite a bit. Um, traditionally as a Datsun. It wasn't the 2022, it was, 2020? It was, it was 2020. Okay, go ahead. Um, as, as Dev and I have talked about before, um, kind of as a youngster the in that, you know, Japanese brands, the Datsun was, it was always a good contender. Of course, you have your Z cars and things of that nature. And when, you know, ever at a point, every brand had their luxury brand. And for years, I wanted an Infinity. I thought that was at the Q35. I thought, it was a good looking coupe. Just everything about it was a car that I wanted. And the more we rented cars with Hertz, the more we ended up with Nissan branded vehicles, uh, including Affinities at a, at a point. So the only one that I ever drove that it was a, it was the coupe. So that's, what are we now? This would have been in 2018. It was a newer one. So that would have been what the G6 Direct, the x60 i can't remember it was decent um it wasn't great it was decent but when in 2000 the beginning of 2018 we were in the market to buy a car we ended up not buying until later in the year and i went and test drove uh, uh infinity coupe that would have been a one says the gx60 highly disappointing um 
I don't know what got into Nissan or didn't get into them, but across their vehicles, they are just not exciting vehicles. <laughs> they, they have lost every bit of like, um, I don't appeal that they ever had. So the reason I caught Dev, I was going down, we have a stretch of uh, street where I live in Bloomington, Illinois, central Illinois. And I noticed, I just happened to notice there was a sport mode on there. And we all know that sport mode does not always equate to actual <laughs> <No>. performance. So <laughs> right. I thought, you know, let me give this a try because this is a brand that I, you know, over the years I've had a love hate relationship with and it was awful. I mean, I know that when you rent a car, what you're getting is all the output of everybody who's ever set foot in that car. And yes, I know that they're fleet cars, so they're not going to get them outfitted with the best options and that kind of thing. But um, Dev also knows as well as Kevin that when I was out in Phoenix a few weeks ago, I had uh, rented a Mustang GT convertible and it was nice. It was a very nice car. Um, I am anti-Ford by nature this is just because I like to keep the, uh, right. but, but if we get a chance, I want to talk about how Ford has impressed me over the last couple of years. But that said, um, it was, it was awful. I mean, like, you may as well not have even had the sport mode in it. It didn't change the driving dynamics <clears throat> to anything because sometimes those, those are gimmicks and all they're doing is they're stiffening up a couple things to give you the impression that you're getting more of a sport feel. And all they're doing is like, it's just kind of gimmicky um, dynamics. I will say all the drive modes on the, that Mustang I were in, it was very nice, uh, were very nice, but the, I have, I don't know what it's going to take to maybe the next Z car will finally do it, mm. but I don't, I don't know how a brand like Nissan or Datsun lost their way so bad. Um, I have yet to drive a Nissan or uh, an Infiniti that I feel like meets the, the, the standard of what like the driving experience should be. Mm. Wow. That's, well, that's uh, let, let me go around this way. We're going to move over to Kev next and then Aaron over to you. Yeah, yeah. What's your take? What do you think about what he's doing? I've never driven a Nissan. I, yeah, I haven't experienced the driving of, of a Nissan, so I really can't speak on it, but the 340, if that's the car he's speaking of, then, mm -hmm. yeah, I think they're going to do something good, at least by the looks of it. I can't speak of the performance and how it may handle and how it may feel. But from a visual standpoint, the car looks like it's going to be a good car to have. Mm. Would you have any reservations about owning a Nissan? That one, no. Actually, some of the older ones. I would rather go with some of the older ones. But mm. the new one, I can't, I, no, the newer ones, no, I'm not too crazy about them. <laughs> Resident Nissan expert, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know that it, it, my daily driver is a, a 2010 uh, Nissan Altima, uh, and I, I did recently uh, rent a Nissan Rogue when I last year when I uh, went to Arizona. Uh, I think you drove it briefly, Kevin, for a little bit. If you don't remember, yeah. but uh, it, it you know it's it's a, I thought it was a good utility, you know, for, you know for a small family, you know, with the hatch and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and I was telling how my, you know, riding with my parents, I mean, they noticed every bump in the road with the short wheelbase and, and maybe even the smaller tires, they felt, they felt everything in the road. They didn't like the way, uh, the ride quality. Uh, but I will say this though, I, I agree. My car is, uh, it's the SL model. So it's got the, you know, it's got the luxury options of leather and bones and everything, but, but I, 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 I'm afraid to jump out in traffic. <laughs> I mean, with the <laughs> But there's there's no response. There's no there's no feel from the from the road in it. Um, it doesn't give you confidence when you hit the gas. I mean, it's a it's a lag when you hit the gas with the CVT um, because the gearing, you, you know, it doesn't have that kind of gearing. So you hit the gas to go, and it's zzz, then it, then it, it gets up to speed. Uh, but I will say this as well. The you know back when I was married, we did have a, uh, a 2007 uh, Maxima. And that thing was that thing was pretty fast. I had the 3.5 V6 in it, and I don't think I don't know for sure if it had the CVT, but 
but when you hit the the, the gas on those, I mean, I think we'll get up and go. You know, it was it was sporty, it was responsive. You know, uh, but that was the idea behind the Maxima, the, the four DSC, the four door sports right. coupe, what they, what they called it. I haven't had an opportunity to drive any since that that generation. You know, because I, I know they have two more since. Um, but I haven't really liked the way, you know, I bought the car out of necessity, but I, I, I just don't like the way they look now, honestly. I do like the way the new Rogue looks. I like the way the, you know, the, the slimmer lights look in front. Um, I like some of the design qualities, but I don't know. I'd like to, I'd like to test drive maybe an Altima SR or, or one of the Maximas, you know, to see if it's still sporty, but it looks, I just don't, I just don't even like the way it looks now. I mean, with all the pointy angles and things, it's just not, it doesn't do anything. Your, 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 your Altima, you said it's a 2010? 2010. Is that a drive-by wire? Uh, you're accelerated. Drive-by wire? What do you mean? Well, you have an actual cable that's connected to the throttle body for acceleration. I'm not 2010, sure. 2010, more likely, you probably do have a cable, I'm imagining. When they switched over? Hmm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I was gonna say a lot of cars with that drive-by wire, they have a tendency to have a slow acceleration as opposed to a something hardlined. Hmm. Is it a turbo or is it normally? It's a, it's a regular four-cylinder. Okay. Regular four-cylinder. Um, okay. but even even the Rogue that I I rented when I was there, you know, that's the same thing. Now it'll rev a little bit once you get going, but. But yeah. that's the thing with the, I, I just don't like CVT transmission. I was going to say, that's that CVT. I, like you I, I like yeah. the feel. It, it's funny because uh, I rented a, a Camry, uh, mm -hmm. a newer Camry, maybe about a, we came up to, to Detroit for a friend of ours wedding. And, uh, and I rented a, it was, I think, a basic SE a Camry. It had a four cylinder as well. But it was it was uh, revy and and you know it felt a lot mm -hmm. sportier you know because when right. you get on the highway when you hit the gas it, it goes you know it's yep. just not a, it's just not that lag you know where you got to wait for the car to, to slowly uh, get up to speed you know you need that I I, I like to, to feel that when I'm when I'm driving or I'm going around curves or you know when you're hitting the gas a little bit going around curves you you, you like to feel something. It's, it's just no feeling there at all. It's just, I mean, it does the job that it's designed to do, but I mean, it's nothing that, you know, I, I enjoy getting in every day to, to drive, you know? Well, that, I think that's been, the difficult, that's been the difficulty with Nissan. I give them credit. They stuck with that CVT when everybody mm -hmm. else decided to bail because you had GM doing it, Ford did it. Um, I think Toyota did it too, didn't they? I, I know they are now. Um, it was like uh, everybody jumped in, I think it was with the early and mid 2000s and came out with mm -hmm. CVTs. But at that time, especially they had to get bigger in order to handle more power that created problems. Mm -hmm. And then they started breaking like mad and they were costly and Nissan, everybody jumped out. Nissan was like, nope, we sticking with it. Yep. Now everybody's back in. I, I know Toyota has one, Honda, <laughs> I think Subaru. Yeah. And so it's, it's back in with the CVT but I, I think they've all still struggled getting it calibrated, like you said, where we're so used to that torque that kicks right. in from the automatic right. transmission. And then I know too, a lot of manufacturers, they, they tinker around with that, what they call throttle tip in. And I think it goes with what yeah. you said, Kev, about that drive by wire systems, which is funny because they messed around with this back during the recession where they was trying to encourage everyone to get better fuel economy. So that way you had to press a little firmer on the gas to get the car moving in mm. order that way you wouldn't use as much fuel leaving the stoplight. Right. And I don't, it's, they can play so many tricks with the calibration now, it's just hard to tell. But I think if you are an old school driver and you know, we remember carburetors, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a whole different feel now and something to get used to. Yeah. I think we're gonna run into the same thing with electric vehicles. Yep. You're gonna have that yep. instantaneous torque. Mm. You're gonna still be, the car is gonna be moving, but you're not gonna hear anything. Exactly, you know? <laughs> so, exactly. There's so much to that overall experience that comes into play. Now, let me touch on this. And, and Dwayne, I want to come back to what you said at the end, because I think this is a, a big key point that you made. I've heard a lot of people say, it, it, I'll say people that, again, remember Datsun. Yeah. And then they watched this transition from Datsun to Nissan. I mean, I think the only one that, that Nissan everybody loves, loves to have is what, a 240? <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Exactly. Those. But yep. 
it does seem like they have lost their way in terms of being competitive with Toyota yep. and with Honda. Um, why do you think that is? If, if you had to cross shop between the yeah. Toyota, the Honda, the Nissan, I'll just leave it at those three. Which yep. one do you choose? And if you wouldn't choose the Nissan, why? So you, you know you're, you're killing me here because you know my, you know my favorite Japanese brand. It's Mazda. So, um, I didn't include them. <laughs> so um, so it, here's what I, if I had to choose, so I'm going to say something that sounds really dumb and it's because you forced me to choose. Um, and I, I'm going to give a little background too. I had gotten to a point where I was European, like German cars, all, you know, Audi, um, Mercedes, uh, all like any of the German engine, even Volkswagen, for that matter. And I always have been a Porsche guy since ever I could remember. But what happened is as I started to really pay attention to what the Japanese brands were doing, um, as I mentioned, I fell for Mazda a little bit more than the others. Um, <clears throat> but I would probably pick Honda. Now, here's the thing. Honda and, and Acura as a luxury brand up till recently had always been my most like overlooked one. No disrespect to the Ludes out there. I, and I think you're sitting in one right now, Kev. No disrespect <laughs> there at all, but it just was not, it was just not my car of choice. But what I will say is I've all, the Accord, the, the Accord is a beautiful car. Yeah. And uh, um, what Honda has done with the minivan, especially their latest iteration, it's like the, the minivan now looks like a Honda, like, a, sorry, like an Accord. Mm -hmm. Like it basically is an Accord uh, minivan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Pacifica, they do a good job in their space with the minivan. But if I, if I had to choose, I probably would go with Honda, even though I'd be cursing the whole time because it would be like, I don't, I don't want to like the Honda and I don't want to <laughs> like the Acura. So mm -hmm. what about you, Kev? How do you feel about where Nissan is at right now? Man, where they're at right now, I really, I can't speak on that. Only because I haven't really followed them too much as of lately. Mm -hmm. um, other than the little articles that I've seen where they're showing the silhouettes or pictures of the 340. I haven't looked at mm -hmm. any of their SUVs or anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, so my feedback on Nissan will be minimal. That says Especially a lot. At this point. <laughs> because somebody from marketing may be watching this. And it's yeah. like, you know, <laughs> we're not reaching him. <laughs> yeah. All right, Aaron, what about you? Would you get in another one, especially of the three that I gave you, if you were looking to replace the Ultima, would you go with Honda, Toyota, or go back to Nissan? Man, I'd probably go Toyota. All right. Um, just, <laughs> I, honestly, Nissan is, is, is not... It's not, it just doesn't do much for you nowadays. E even the Z, you know, and I, I've, you know, looked at the, you know, the new 400 Z that they're supposed to be coming out with. And I kind of, I kind of like the way it looks, but, you know, it almost looks a little recyc recycled a little bit, the proportions and everything. I know they're trying to keep a certain proportion, but it's almost uh, too, you know, uh, too much the same the way it was. It says some body changes. Uh, and Honda, I'll be honest with you. Now, I've always considered Hondas to be reliable. Um, I think you know, you got the Prelude and you got the the, uh, the the S2000, you know, but those are the only, to me, the only manly masculine vehicles they make. I mean, I mean honestly, the from the Civic to the Accord, everything they make is, you, I, you think of Honda, I think of a, a woman's car, honestly. It's the same when I think of a Kia. I think of a woman's car. It's just this, just, just the way uh, I, I feel about them. Um, Toyota, you know, I think Toyota. I would pick them because they have a. I mean, you, you can't beat the resale value, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you know when you buy a Toyota, you're gonna probably retain its value, you know, to you know to a certain extent uh, as long as you take care of it. Uh, but even but even Toyota, um, as far as performance vehicles go. Um, you know, I know about the small coupe they have, but but even those, the eighty six. Yeah, the eighty six. I mean, the BMW. I see, I yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But, but I don't even. I don't really like that. The, 
you know, that they made. I, I, wow. I it sounds good. <laughs> but like, well, again, it's really it's basically a BMW, so. Yeah, but yeah, I just, yeah. I was, you know, when it came out with it, I was a little disappointed when, when it came out. Um, I, I don't, I don't like the, I don't like the, the, the bulbous kind of curves to it and, and mixed with the pointiness. And, and when I think of Supra, you know, I, I think of, you know, fast sports car with, with the big wing in the back. And, you know, uh, that was the last one I thought was pretty, uh, pretty good. Uh, but I would go with Toyota just by, by, by default, by default. And I'm surprised you didn't add Mazda into the group because nope. when, when, you, when you're talking about, you know, out of all of them, and I, I think that's where Nissan gets caught in the middle is because they, they can't compete with, you know, with the Honda and Toyota uh, on one side, but then Mazda kind of has carved this niche for uh, a more of driver experience. So Nissan yeah. is kind of caught in the middle where they, they you know, it's kind of like they're trying to be sporty with some of the proportions, but then they're not, you know, so they're kind of just playing this middle ground uh, w without ever sticking to something. Right. You hit right where I was going to go. That's right. You segue perfectly into that. That's why I did not include Mazda in the conversation. <laughs> if we look at the listing of Asian manufacturers, yeah. you mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. would say your Honda, Toyota, and probably Hyundai, Kia, they're more, and, and of course, Nissan, they're more full line manufacturers. But then we start right. with Mazda. Now we start putting right. kind of in that category of Subaru, where it's yep. not really a complete yeah. line, no luxury yep. line, et cetera. But- yeah. But I think this, you, you hit it, Aaron. This is of all the choice of the three that I laid out there, Nissan would be my last choice. Yep. Because if I wanted something for resale purposes and, and for almost anything I would think I would want for my overall lifestyle, being a family man, et cetera, right. I would mm -hmm. probably have to go Honda or Toyota. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on, if I was looking for a crossover, I've had a CRV before, so I might go that route. Minivan, I probably would go Toyota to the Sienna. I like the hybrid mm -hmm. now. Um, it depends on what I was looking for, which I would choose one of those, but I can't think in any situation that I would go with Nissan. Not to mention, I don't know if I can trust the quality. And right. if I look at the Infinity line, I would like to look at Infinity, but for the price that I think I would pay for an Infinity, now I might have to go shop a cheaper Audi. Or I might right. even have to shop an Acura because Acura can't really sell vehicles anyway. So I probably could get a pretty good deal on them. And so, yep. you know, once I start looking at all of that, then I'm like, well, can I afford the Lexus? And right. then, once again, there you go. Say, but here's where I want to bring Mazda back into the, into the conversation. Right. We know that Mazda news came out that they're going to discontinue the six. There's a rumor out in the street that they're going to come back with a rear wheel drive model. We don't know if that's going to happen or not, but that's the rumor out in the street. Mazda now, and let me, I have to make this point to be fair to Nissan, although Nissan, where they play, we, we got to remember they are backed by Renault. Renault is much more wider in Europe. And then we also have Mitsubishi because they own Mitsubishi now as well. So they are pretty huge in terms of their overall volume of cars. So they have all of that. But I think for the US, it almost seems like they would be better off going down to where Mazda is at. Or Mazda may start creeping up and overtaking Nissan because it's like the Rogue is the one thing Nissan has is rock solid that they still sell a lot of. Yeah. If Mazda could get that one model that starts kicking the Rogue's butt, it almost seems like once you get people in, Mazda has enough products to probably keep people maybe well, another car. So Dwayne, you the Mazda lover? What do you think yeah. about that? Theory? So I, I think you've hit a, on, a, on it all. And, you know, the main thing is Mazda has well, there's two things that they've done, and they're slowly coming out of one of them. One is they have not created a luxury line. They've decided, like, uh, for the for longest um, uh, Genesis, they were doing that. They did not, they, their model said, nope, we're going to brand this Genesis. We're going to sell them in the regular dealerships. And then they had to break with that and say, well, if we're ever going to get serious about this, um, we're going to have to be more intentional um, and not just hiring Audi, uh, former Audi designers will right. do it. Um, the other thing that uh, Mazda has done, and I've been trying to follow this to understand why, and I saw that they finally, I mean, know they're finally doing something, but they've been dragging their feet on going into the electric space. They, for whatever reason, they have decided, like, we're going to just hunker down and we're going to fight this like until we can't anymore. 
And what that usually means for Mazda is they've got something else in mind. They're, they, they have something in their hip pocket. But two, the big thing is they've decided that the CX-9 and to some degree the 5, but they've decided that CX-9 is going to be their flagship vehicle. Mm. And they're putting all the eggs in that basket and they refuse to do another line. So like, like they're kind of playing smart, but they're not playing by the rules that everybody else is playing by. Is it because they think like most automatic automakers right now that you need to have a big crossover to really, I guess, especially for Americans because Americans are big. So Americans want big cars. And so do you think it's that they're putting all their weight behind a crossover or we can't really call it an SUV. It's still a crossover um, because they feel like that's, that's just the best bet right now. I know they yeah, have so, electric because they really can't afford it. Yeah. So part of it is, it, I can never quite put my hand on it or put my, my finger on it. One of the things, even with, you know, their, their, then arguably their best car ever is the MX-5 and mm. uh, the, the Miata. And part of what happened with, you know, that's the lines that my car comes from. And it's been said that had not, if FCA hadn't played nice with them, that they would not have been able to bring the same car to market. And, you know, from a proportion standpoint, the MX-5 is like perfectly balanced. Um, they, have what, last year or in, I want to say it was 20 or 19, maybe back in 18, they finally gave it the bur uh, burst in power it needed, um, that kind of thing. But they, um, I, like you said, part of it too is they just don't have the, the resource. Um, the only other way they could probably jump quickly is to merge with another brand. Mm. And I don't know, like since the days of when they were, what was it, with Ford, I don't know if there's any other brand that would want to take on uh, what they they have so they're, they're playing it safe um they do kind of in their own way kind of remind me of bmw as far as like they're always going to make it about the driving dynamics you're very rarely you know we we leased uh or not lease we rented uh um the uh cx not the cx5 or the cx the three uh the, the what's 30 the 30 okay um it's the and so it, yeah, it's the smaller, it's, it's the one that's putting the, the CX-3 to pasture. Okay. It was, it was okay, but for sure had the turbo lag. That's why I was asking you before, Aaron, if you had a turbo, like, mm -hmm. I would say somewhere near like six of the last seven cars we've owned have had turbos. So you do have to get used to that turbo lag, and that was part of it. But like I said, they just don't, Dev, you hit it on the, the nail on the head. They don't have the money probably to do and it'll be interesting i know it's one of your topics to see what actually is going to going to come of this cx50 that they've been talking about i mean everybody's trying to do like where this cx30 is landing at trying to do some kind of crossover to still give them that kind of car feel but at the same time you know give you that crossover suv type of roominess but uh kev what do you think how, how would you feel about what i said about the monster brand anything to miss you think they got a chance to jump up and take out nissan uh yeah you know, what, what do you think on the monster front take well i'm looking at with the 30 and if that's going to be like a car proportion but with suv roominess yeah see, see for me that's that's all right and i like that because I think the automakers got away from cars too quickly mm. to only want to go to SUVs and trucks. Mm -hmm. Some people still want something a little smaller to get around in. And then considering everybody's trying to go with electrical or hybrid, more so than with electrical, you're still limited to what you're going to be able to do with these large vehicles being electrified. Right. So, I mean, I don't think they're going to surpass Nissan, but I think Maybe they need to sell themselves off to somebody that's got already some electric, automotive electrical in their base, and that can really do something with their vehicles. That's a good point, because they may be forced to do something eventually, whether they like it or not. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in so, a second. Yep. What about yeah, so you? That's the other thing, too, that because of what, how they've dragged their, dragged their feet to get in this space and how the laws are starting to work vehemently against them, I'm not sure how they're going to show up in this space or what they're going to do. Here's your MX-30. Mm. 
and it's it, it's it's okay um you know i'll just say it's okay <laughs> and i would say rather from a design standpoint especially um the back end um very disappointing for what i was expect of mazda yeah it reminds me somewhat of a citrion vehicle wow yep. that's a good point <laughs> that's a good point yeah what about yeah. you Eric? I mean, I think that they're, they're always going to, you got to keep the CX-9, first of all. You, you're right. You got to have a, you got to have a, a, some kind of seven passenger vehicle uh, if you want to compete in the, in the marketplace, with, you know, and it gives you some options. Although I, I was a little disappointed when they, the, the newest model they made smaller than the other the older CX-9. The CX-9 was a much larger uh, seven passenger vehicle, a lot more uh, space, but the newer one is, is, is much more beautiful. Um, I like the way it looked. It actually, I mean, the design of it actually was one of the few vehicles that caught my eye. Like when you see it in person on the highway or something, nope. and you look at the proportions of it, you're like, man, that's a nice looking, nice looking car. Um, but I think, I think they they could uh, overtake Nissan if they if they focused. You know, I think there's I think what what you're gonna start to see is with the onset of all these electrical vehicles. They, yeah, some of them, they have a lot of torque, you, you know, they might be fast in certain kind of ways, but I think there's always going to be a market for for drivers, you know, for people who who, who like a certain kind of feel to a vehicle. Um, and if they can keep that, then they'll always, because because you're always going to have that 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 niche, you know, maybe you may not sell as many as Toyota or, or as Honda, uh, but as long as you keep a, a, a niche, you'll always be relevant. Once you lose something, some kind of niche. I mean, look at look at Chrysler now. They don't have a. They have no identity whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So so Nisa, uh, so Mazda has that identity of of being a more of a driver's car like BMW. So they can play on that and mm -hmm. they can they can you know parlay that into something uh, bigger if they really wanted to. And and then you have to you know sometimes you have to decide how big do you do you want to compete or Big, get big, or do you want to stay in a, a in in a niche kind of space? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I because so. I mean, sometimes it might be more valuable to to do that than to try to uh, uh, go and compete with Honda or Toyota to a certain extent. That's you know? what I think Subaru has done a superb job of doing. If you think about it, Subaru could have easily they could have brought back the Baja a long time ago. They could have tried to chase that and let's come out. And in a way they did, I think, what is it with the SUV? Was it the Ascent? They, they did kind of do that, get pulled into, let me come out with a crossover because everyone else has one. But the Outback is unique. You know, I'm, we're going to do our next show on that. I don't think if we had time to get to it today because I thought I wanted to make that a topic as well. I love wagons. I was looking for, I was going to put up the Mazda Sport <laughs> Wagon because that was my favorite Mazda from like 05, 06 era. But you know, Subaru, the Outback, they are the ones that have stuck with, because it's a unique station wagon, but that's what it is exactly. It's a station wagon. That's basically, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. The Forester oh, is a- You middle. jumped in for a minute and they, huh? they chickened out too quickly. And right. every time I happen to catch one of them out there, it's like, man, they really missed the mark there. They they yep. they could have stuck with it just a little bit longer. I think yes. they would have had some success. Is yeah. it Buick? Yep. Or Buick Cross, uh, Cross I, Tour, I, like, I think is what I like that. I yep. like that car too. Yep. It's not. It's not. I'm calling it the wrong name. Cross Tour is the Honda. It's the Regal. Regal. Uh, uh, yeah. The Regal. Uh, something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And yep. That's gonna lead me to my next question because, um, well, I, I, let me just finish up on the Mazda tip. Yeah, or Subaru. I think Subaru did a great job of staying right where they needed to be. They didn't chase. They got. They got a loyal following. People right. own one Outback, they may get a Forester or they may get another Outback. And we all know, you know, we all in the cars and from an enthusiast standpoint, Lancer, gone. The, we know the, the Hot Rod Focus didn't stay around long enough. Yeah, but right. that Impreza, right. WRX, STI, that's still the one guys our age will run around <laughs> and pick up. Because like you said, Aaron, you look at some of the other ones and it's like, Nah, I just don't feel manly enough driving that car. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Let me come back. And that is, and okay. that's the other thing with, you know, when I brought up the MX-5, that's that's the issue right there. Yep. Um, one of the, the longest running Roadster uh, to date, um, one of the funnest, best cars to drive, but it can't, oftentimes cannot get over that stigma. 
Yep. And so um, that's that's been part of the only reason. So to your point, if that the rumors serve right, if they have some new you know, rotary rear rear wheel drive, something that they are really working on mm-hmm. besides the CX50, I don't think that's going to do it for them. Right. If they come back with something that says, yep, we know how to do this and we can compete with the Camaros and the Mustangs and the, uh, some of the others well, with the, uh, the uh, Aaron just said here how Chrysler has lost their identity and I'm blanking out on their, uh, uh, their, their the name of their car. Here. No, the, the their muscle oh. car. Oh, the, the no, uh, Challenger. Challenger, thank you. I don't know why I was uh, blanking out on it, but yeah. But if if Mazda could do something in that space, it would be a game changer for them. Well, all right. Let me let me go on to the next topic here because this one I think y'all kind of we, we 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 danced around it, but now I want to deep d- dig deeper into it because we've just got done talking about some Japanese manufacturers. But Kev, I'm going to start with you first on this one. Why is it? And we are all former Detroiters. That's our connection. So (laughs) as former Detroiters, one thing, and again, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show, because Black folks buy cars that are oftentimes, we set the trends for our communities. And being in Detroit, even right now in 2021, there still seems to be more love initially given, at least if we're talking about Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. I know the obvious is because everybody and their grandmama, and I do mean that literally, work for the plant. So you go buy an American car because that's where you get a discount. Right. I can first say it's not that way in other parts of the country, you know, in, in Arizona, Florida, et cetera. There are black folks that will buy a foreign car. But Kevin, do you still see, I'm talking about the overall black community as a collective. Do you still see black folks generally not wanting to buy a Japanese car? Because I don't, and, and I don't even think that same stigma is there for German cars because mm-hmm. the German is still a status symbol. But do you think there's still, I'm going to say, I don't care whether we're talking about on the quality report or what we're looking at. Do you still think the black community as a whole gives love first to the three domestic manufacturers before they would give it to the Asian manufacturers? Oh. I think it depends on the vehicle. Now, I say that mm. because right now, you can look at any video out of Detroit and everybody is driving around and either a Chrysler 300, <laughs> something got with the Hellcat engine in it at this point, or the Hellcat, uh, not Hellcat, but Scat Pack or an mm. RT. Uh, for a while, people weren't looking at Japanese cars. They were looking at foreign because they were prestigious, BMW, Mercedes, even Volvo and Audi. Mm. But as when rely, reliability began to diminish they began to look at other manufacturers if it if it wasn't you know uh, american then they would begin looking at some of the japanese cars japanese cars were having a greater higher reliability and lasted a little bit longer Mm -hmm. so they were getting away from the german cars between the two i still think that they will put an american car first on their plate with japanese cars second and then German cars third. Do you think that's a mistake or you think that's probably how it is normal? It, it should be that way. I, it, I would say normal only because if they're putting the, the, the food on your table mm. and back in the day, that was almost like a prerequisite. You could even drive. <laughs> if you worked at any of them, you had to drive one of their cars right. to the plant. And by, when I started working at the plant, they got to the point if you worked at Chrysler, you could drive the, a GM car in. You That's couldn't right. park in the front. Better park on the could, outside. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You can mm-hmm. still drive one and buy it. But you know, it's, when you buy what you make, you only incentivize and put more money into your pocket in the first place. Ooh, that's what's up. So, Wayne, what you I got? Was, oh, I'm sorry, we're doing. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, Kev. No, I was uh, I was still if it's you if you were in Detroit, America, I was go with you. American cars first, then Japanese cars, then German cars. Yep. All right. So I um I think you brought up a good point, uh, Dev. A lot of it has to do, um, and I can only speak from my experiences, the um, hip hop influences. Mm. 
So you have, a, I want to say it was Cameron, I saw in an interview once, and he said, you know, everybody's running out, getting the Maybachs and all of a sudden, and that kind of thing. He says, those don't have resale value. He said, you know, he basically said, I've flipped like five muscle cars in my, you know, in the last few years. And you even look at um, like what happened to Kevin Hart a couple, was that two years now when he, mm-hmm. like, I, I follow him on, cause he's a great uh, social influencer. Like he, he engages with all, his audiences pretty well. And um, one, I saw the car that he ended up having. I, I saw it, he had gotten it for like his birthday and I just kept Cuda. staring at it um, to find out a few weeks later, like, you know, he literally almost died in that car. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the rumor was, well, it was, uh, it was a four seater that they had converted it to a two seater because he had put the, some of the uh, things he had down to the back seat to get the extra power and that kind of thing. And they didn't know if he had taken off the traction control or if it didn't have contract or traction control, but I'm kind of getting off point here. But that said, um, you, along with what you said about everybody and their mama working in the plant is that idea of the muscle cars. And so a muscle car is, is, is all Detroit. Um, I also think that um, what happened when the Fast and Furious franchise first came about um, there was always this thought of if you had a Civic that was, you know, had a, an, an updated exhaust or anything, it was, the comment was always, oh, you've got one of those Fast and Furious cars. It was never, uh, hey, you got a Civic or whatever. It was always like, you got this Fast and Furious cars, one of those Fast and Furious cars. The other thing I know for myself, I'm an exhaust guy. And when you, when you, cr- when you turn on a Chrysler, you know, or a Ford Mustang or a Camaro Corvette, you're going, you're going to hear it in a way that is very unique from some of these others. And there's not any big sports cars of those others that really do that quite the same. Hold on, you're going to have to start this car right now while he's sitting in it? <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. But, but oh, so man. again, here's the other thing. I know that both of you got uh, exhaust and what you do is that, and we all know like the history of how these came about. The like they inherited the parents' car, and like especially out in Cali, and you know, like who wants to drive around in their parents' bus the Civic, um, and the you know the rest is uh, history, if you will. Um, but to that point, I think you're touching on something else that's like a whole nother conversation. There is an embedded bias between those communities. And I don't understand exactly where it comes from. I know some of it comes from, we talked about this in uh, some of our favorite movies before. If you look at um, Menace to Society, Mm. that first few minutes, which um, I unfortunately have taken to uh, a habit of quoting that phrase, I feel sorry for your mother, but I use it a little (laughs) bit differently than they use it in the movie. But that, all of that in the, the story of the, and I'm forgetting the name of the young lady who was shot by the store owner. All of that plays into some of the biases that we have against wow. that, that community That's that really right. shouldn't be there because we have very similar histories mm-hmm. of how we've been treated in this country. And so um, I think you and I had either, I think you had suggested it as a topic, and I know I'm getting way off topic here, but there is something that's really off when you look at what's happening with that that whole uh, Asian hate thing, because too many of them are from people who look like us. And I don't know where, like I said, I know where some of it comes from, but it shouldn't be that way, like I said, from a historical standpoint. But what I, I, I think the other thing that is definitely, like you said it well, the, the hip hop community has a huge influence. Um, I know um, when the 300 first came out, you know, there was that running story of like Snoop was calling up everybody that he could get a hold of saying how could I get this 300 Mm -hmm. and like those kind of things like they couldn't that kind of publicity they couldn't pay for and it's like what's happened in the hip-hop and the music community they've gone from like I said these like classic muscle cars and they skip right over everything else in between and go straight to you know the exotics and the, the Bentleys and the, the McLarens and that kind of thing. So, like I said, it's it's just a weird dynamic. 
And when it comes back to it, a lot of the hip hop artists still are very much fans of Cadillac. So um, I want to say it was uh, Kim Kardashian just got uh, Escalade, like kind of all fitted out. Um, yeah. That Cadillac has managed to still kind of capture that audience. And like I said, as a community, if they're not on a lodge with it with a <laughs> with a um, a 300 or a Challenger or uh, um, the Charger, it's yeah, just yeah. yeah, it's it's they they don't. The next thing they're going to go to is the BMW, the yeah. uh, the the Mercedes and that kind of thing. So I, I took quite of a sidebar there, but it is something I've thought about, and it, it was just, it was the same for me. It wasn't until about maybe 2010 or so that I really started paying attention to some, some of what the Asian markets had to offer. Mm -hmm. I, I had to laugh real quick, and Aaron, I'm gonna jump to you next. But right when you were talking, my neighbor uh, picked up a CTSV wagon. And so while you were talking about Cadillac, et cetera, I didn't know if y'all heard, I was gonna put it on mute because he is one, two, he is, three houses over so he's about my 230 position mm -hmm. and he put an exhaust on there so he just cranked it up and i wondered if y'all yep. heard it i didn't he hear it. it up that car is loud yeah, yeah. Yep. Fact, now he's leaving man if i could jump yes. up my computer i'll put the mic right there <laughs> <laughs> but uh and i mean it sounds great yep. it's a navy blue yellow calipers um yep. and it's one of those cars again that it's like wow this car is gone but it yep. was for a unique and specific market. And I'm, I'm going yep. to mention that after Aaron, you go, because I don't want to cut you yep. off. Aaron, yep. back on that question about the significance of uh, Black folks having a, a kind of, um, by default, feeling like I, I have to stick with the domestics. And I'll tell you, let me quickly say where that question is also coming from. I've noticed even resistance, especially with, you know, my parents' age, we'll say the baby boomers, or just those who live in the, where all the factories and the plants are at. Yeah. You know, when they first come to you, they're like, hey, I want to pick up a Buick such and such. And I'm like, yeah, but what you're looking for, you might want to get the Honda. And they're like, oh, those it's hard to get parts for those. I'm like, mm. yeah, 1988. Isn't that <laughs> the thing is made down in Marysville, Ohio now? Or whatever. Right. <laughs> Actually, the well, Buick you're looking at is made in Shanghai or something. It's made in China. You know? <laughs> right. But yet, they don't realize that. Um, and so it's fighting that even kind of view that foreign cars are hard to find parts for or... It, there is there's still so much unknown and it's 2021 you know again what do we do with all of that now i i don't i don't i don't know if, i will say it's because you you got to figure you got to look at history uh you, you got to look at the cars you got to figure in loyalty history and loyalty as as well um you're talking detroit here okay I mean, this is this is the Motor City. This is this is where you, you got to figure in our history. This is all we know. All we know is 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 American vehicles. The the Asian market didn't come into America and come into our lives until the late seventies into the eighties. And you really you, right. you may have saw some, but when you saw them back then, they they did nothing for you. All our memories you have are in American vehicles. When you think back to your childhood. You think of the American vehicles that your parents had. You think of street racing. You think of muscle cars. You think of all these things. This this is ingrained in us. You know, I, you know, I I own a foreign vehicle now. You know, as an older person, as you get older, you you buy out of necessity more, rather than you know what you want sometimes. So and and I think during those times you you tend to to buy, but I think you always if what I will want really is is not a foreign car not because it's a foreign car right, it's right. just because i i want something that's got some muscle i want a challenger or a charger or a, you know or or something like that you know this is what this is what we know this is what we we've been raised on this is where our memories are this is that's we've kind of got a, a, a relationship with the big three automakers you see um even now talking about you know chrysler that the, the loyalty we have you know, I know guys around here, there was a GM powertrain here in Fredericksburg before. So a lot of the uh, older uh, black people around here work there as well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and they still loyal to that thing. The deacon I, I, at my church that I work with, um, 
he he was a GM guy, and that's all he buys now. Still, it's, it's all GM. Silverado. Yep. Why yeah. I think it's all GM. Um, so I think there's a there's a connection there based on on our history and and, and the loyalty that we have uh, to that. And and really, we're a soulful people. You know, I don't think the the Asian market hits. But I'll say this: so we, we we kind of forget that the Asian market also includes the luxury vehicles. Mm-hmm. The black people mm-hmm. are will will buy the Lexuses, That's the safe. vehicles that because we we also also have a we like big luxury cars as well. You know, that's why Cadillac has always stayed around and been re- relevant because having big luxurious cars, you know. I know they make some more, some sporty, but those aren't the main sellers. You know, they sell big, you know, more luxury cars at a more affordable price than a Mercedes or a BMW. So you could get a Cadillac and you still have some status with you as a cat with a Cadillac. And so some of the luxury makers from Asia did come and things like the Lexus and, you know, not so much the Acura, as I would say, but you know they gave you a little more status and they were comfortable, so people would, um, would, would buy those. So I think with time, you'll see that as the younger generation don't have those same ties that that some of us generation generation Xers have. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the new ones they're more likely they grew up on the Fast and the Furious. You know, for the longest time, I, you know, I just call them rice burners. I'm like, what, what is that noise they make? Right. You know, right. you, know you, you really think that's, that's not. And we do recognize the rice burner as being a pejorative now. That is, <laughs> we have to point that out. It definitely. Right, but I used to say that, have you never seen a permanent wrinkle on the right. back of a, a slick where, where so much torque and the tires still got right. it? You know, I, you know what it sounds like, when you, you know? Yeah. Like, it, it, once you hear that, once you go up on that, it's, you really can't. You can't do do away with. It. I don't know how old you. So so it has to be slowly uh, throughout time. You know, uh, uh, replace itself. And I think the younger generation are more inclined. This is what they have now. Their muscle. They're they're you know back in the you know fifties and sixties with the muscle cars and, and that generation. Mm-hmm. Their generation now is the Honda Civics, the Preludes, the the things. That's their affordable car that they can fix up and yep. make fast. So that's what they have now. So. They'll do that, and their kids will remember. Daddy had that prelude, and Daddy had that, you know, that yep. civic, and, and yep. so they'll probably, you know, lean towards that. And they'll look at the other cars like this: a that big old Chrysler 300. You can't even turn corners in that thing. You know right. what I mean? It's yep. a big look at that challenge. It's like two tons, you know, because that's what you hear now. You know, that's a car I, I like, but you talk to people, you know car enthusiasts, a lot of them, they're like, yeah, it's a big brick, you know, that's what they yeah, say. It's, exactly. not, really a, it's yeah. not really a sports car. You know, it's really made for older muscle car heads, honestly. Um, so you'll see it. Yeah. I think you'll see it change over time. But I think I think in Detroit itself, you see it change more everywhere else. But I think in Detroit itself, I think you, there's always going to be the history in that, yep. that loyalty yeah. and that nostalgia, nostalgia that you have with the big three, you know, because it is. I mean, until they get rid of, you know, Woodward every year and with auto, you know, there's always gonna be that there. And I don't think I don't think it's anything that the you know Asian markets could do to 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 get over that. That's really what's kept a lot of uh American vehicles alive is that history and loyalty um that we so, have. So Dev, I was gonna throw in real quickly, I was going through this in my head as I was thinking about it. And I was talking about the hip hop influences. There is a handful of hip hop references that um, make, and they're all the New York rappers because, again, there uh, the foreign cars were not, it didn't have the same nostalgia. So, probably the most infamous one or famous one is going to be um, Biggie when he says, you know, the Lexus LS four and a half. You've got uh, uh, um, Wu Tang when they talk about rolling up the MPVs. Again, they're talking Mazda. You've got, um, there was another one I was thinking of. Uh, well, back when EPMD, when he says, you know, I drive a cor- Corvette, he drives a Samurai Suzuki. <laughs> like, you, they, there are references um, throughout that, that um, there's one other, and I can't remember offhand, but, oh, there's a, I want to say it's the locks or somebody like that. And they say, like, there's a line, I, I've got more lot, more cars than, or more rhymes the Mazda has, he says millenniums, but he means yeah. millennia. But oh. um, like I said, you didn't see that kind of lyricism. And at the time, there weren't a lot of Detroit or Midwest rappers either, but 
they're not it, it, there's definitely a uh, a Midwest versus East yes. Coast for sure West Coast because a Subaru is like you know a Chevy out, yes. out west especially when you get exactly. into the pack Northwest so exactly. it, it definitely is something culturally that is in, embedded us to your point Aaron yeah, yeah I, I was gonna say one more thing one more thing I'm sorry but I think if, if Asian make as they make more vehicles that 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 we're we're more soulful people like there was some cars like the, the Acura Legend that's a car that mm -hmm. I know a lot mm -hmm. of black folks love. I still like, I still think that's a classic looking vehicle from 92, yeah. 93, 94, running there. Nice looking vehicle. I know several guys that have, matter of fact, all you, you might run into one and it's still good mm -hmm. and you'll see a black person driving it, you know? So it's the, I think it also depends on the vehicle. I think there's, there's always there's been a stigma from seeing what they were from the 70s and 80s. I mean, you remember, I mean, they Asian cars, you know, Japanese cars just wasn't, they just didn't look good. They, you know, they just were, you know, they were uh, affordable because of the gas prices and they, you know, they were for a certain utility, but they weren't, they weren't soulful. They didn't move you in that kind of fashion. Now, now let me do a quick comment. Can we do, can everybody hang 10 minutes? 10 minutes work? Yeah, right. for sure. Actually, I want to, I want to, I had all these other questions down, but I think I want to kick, keep with this Japanese theme for a second and, and, and we'll finish the show. We'll just make it an all Japanese manufacturer show. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I got some stuff I want to add, but Kev, go ahead and jump in there. Oh, I was just going to piggyback off of Dwayne when he was mentioning about Wu-Tang Clan and the MPV. The MPV in New York was, had significance because New Yorkers always use those to do their dirty in. Mm. They always talked about how many, the room, the doors, the pockets. So that whatever they were into doing at that time, the MPV catered to their necessity, to, to, I didn't know to their need. I think, I think <laughs> yeah. it was either Donut Media. I, I can't remember, shout out to Donut Media, love their videos. I can't remember who it was, or it was either a website that did a whole article, but they actually looked at uh, hip hop lyrics and the cars they mentioned. And so they pretty much, uh -huh. Dwayne, you did a great job because they, uh, most of the ones I heard on there, you just rolled off. And I think <laughs> right. that's huge because yeah. again, it shows the influence that we had. Yep. And you know, I'm, I want to go back real quick because I think you, you touched on the Asian hate thing. And that, I think that definitely needs to be touched on because it's that part of, I always said in Detroit, we didn't know that. Because if anything, Detroiters always had issues. You heard there was more strife between the Middle Eastern community Eastern. and between the Black folks there. And I think it, I mean, let's keep it real. In a system of white supremacy, you always have a buffer class. That's why I'm kind of skeptical even on some of these Asian crimes because they always use a buffer class. And so in Detroit, they use Middle Eastern folks as a buffer class because it's like, the white folks didn't want to own a gas station in Detroit. So they let the Middle Easterners own a gas station. As big as Detroit was at that time when we were growing up, I think it was in the 87, if not 90% black. But yet I only remember two black owned gas stations in that entire city. And then we know you mentioned in uh, LA, uh, was it Latasha Harlins when she got killed? You know, it was, and we know with OJ, after, without OJ, um, after the Rodney King verdict, when they went and they started burning everything up and they burned a lot of Korean stores up, is messed up because many of those so-called minority groups get pushed in as that buffer class. And it's like, we know y'all are mad about white supremacy, but go get them. Don't, you know, we, we don't own the stores. And so um, I, I noticed that it's funny in Detroit where you didn't have that same animosity toward a group of people, yet the cars still are the ones that everybody kind of like, eh, but it goes into what you said, Kev. You go to Will's putting food on your table. And at the end of the day, because the first car we had, the first Japanese car I owned was a 92 Honda Civic. And I ended up counting because I got mad at Honda when it took them a while to replace my airbags, which kind of goes back to that story about taking long for parts. The airbags got stolen in Detroit in my driveway and it took them forever to send those airbags, but it was because they were an explosive and they had to come from Great Britain. But um, I remember telling Honda, all the people that I knew that bought Honda vehicles because I bought a Honda vehicle. Actually, it was the time my girlfriend bought one. And then we got married and ended up being a car. We were doing street racing in that car. ODX with some roll up windows, five speed, pop the clutch, and then a little 13 inch donuts on there. But it was a reliable car. And I think that's, that's the one thing I think once black folks, especially move out of the Midwest, once they get outside of the Midwest bubble and they start owning a Kia, 
they start owning a Honda, a Toyota. Then it's like, you know what? These are not some bad cars, especially when they're reliable and they realize they don't have to, you know, our generation, our dad's generations, they were used to getting a new car at every 100,000 miles. Mm -hmm. But that's because there was planned obsolescence in there. We wanted to break down at 100,000 so you can go get another one because as long as we got you slave in the plant, buying a new car, you can't ever leave your job. You're never going to improve yourself because you got to pay for that new ride. And so <laughs> I've watched that cycle over and over again. But let me just, I, I want to flash this up real quick of that influence of cars. And you, you mentioned with hip hop and it just made me think of some cars that, you know, again, black folks really put on the map to me. And we, we go back to the Chevy Impala SS. That's right. You know, that was one car. This was hot in the hood. You know, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Boys had one. Um, yep. You 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 got street cred for rolling around in this, and then the other exactly. one was the Mercury Marauder. Yep, for sure. <laughs> Another blacked out car, but yep. in the hood, yeah. you got props for rolling yep. in that. Unfortunately, especially for the Marauder, this is I think the problem that the black community always has. On, on one end, we do set the trends, but the downside is we oftentimes just do not have the numbers to just right. automaker doing a yep. whole entire program. Yep. Um, but we do have the numbers to move the needle. And yep, once we make sure. it escalate hot, it's on. I, I know for a fact, Lexus has always reached out heavily to the black community. Cause what you said earlier about the premium brands, you know, yep. they, they want to reach that market. And I just wonder, even when we get to this new electric vehicle era, how all of that's going to play out. How are they going to get black folks in there? Because one right. thing we also know, we are very more, we'll just use the term conservative when it comes to technology as well. One reason we can't afford it. Right. <laughs> so that's well, what I was well, one of the things that's gonna be the biggest problem. Yep. Right. Well, and one of the things too is that not just the infrastructure on the road. I'm gonna call it, and it's not the right way to say it, but I'll say it this way: the infrastructure in the home. Yes. You have to have a particular kind of setup. So um you Within reason, if you can't, especially, you know, Tesla did a great job of this, of just basically making it feel more like your iPhone. So if you can't plug in at night, there's going to create a, a gap there. If you are like, I don't know how most of the folks who maybe own or lease a Tesla and also like live in more of a apartment kind of a set, I don't know what they're, if they just charge them at the local stations or what, but like I said, that's going to be a huge um, leap. So you even think about um, what's going to happen with the Hummer. Again, I was literally just having this conversation with Jacob, one of my twins. And I was saying one of the things that really put Hummer in their next phase when they were starting to come out with the next generation is when LeBron, um, I don't know if you all remember that controversy with LeBron when he was coming out of high school. Yeah. And he had gotten I'm a, I'm a in that – um, that pushed that H2 like into like instant stratosphere of like, you got to get it. You got to get the, the H2. And so um, like you said, there's all these different ways that um, culture will definitely influence like some of those uh, buying decisions. And um, to that point, everybody's trying to figure out their niche right now for what they're going to do. I do. Um, uh, I have seen a lot of great things when I came in. And that is one of the, the slowly but surely that barrier keeps keeps getting chipped away. Um, I see some now that I like, but there is nothing that's gonna a manual exhaust uh, vehicle is always gonna be the the sweet spot for me. I don't um, I can't ever see that changing. Yeah, I, I have to throw in there, and I'm I know we got three more minutes, but I want to say real quick, Aaron, you touched on something I thought about, and Dwayne, you nailed it as well. I think Detroit bought itself some time for another generation. That is, that might be our next show, y'all. Because think about it. If you wouldn't have had the resurgence of the Mustang, Camaro, and Challenger, and especially with what oh. Mopar has done with the 392s and the Hellcats, you again now have a whole new generation of young kids. Now, I know my people in Detroit, I, I mean, my boy tell me all the time, Doug, I'm sick and tired. All these things <laughs> running up and down the street, running into folks and blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, stealing them left and right. But you now have a whole generation of people graduating high school, graduating mm -hmm. college, and that's the fun muscle car that they've seen 
just yep. like really with almost to say our parents, because y'all got to admit when we graduated in the late eighties and early nineties, it wasn't a whole lot. I mean, you had the Mustang, right. the I Rock, but it wasn't <laughs> right. right. Well, we were coming off of that, um, the, the the gas embargo and all that other good stuff. Yep. And so, exactly. what's funny now is when you look at some of these, you know, these like classic finds or anything else like that. Um, what also becomes a little bit funny is to look at the specs on some of these cars. You're looking at like 14 inch wheels and like, you know, 1.3 liter. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> a, a 120 horsepower and you're going, what? <laughs> like, and I'm being somewhat funny, but you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. how, where was that? Like we lost all that. And so to your point, it was good when, um, when that race started again of, you, you know, Camaro and uh, it was like a bit of time when they tried to uh, GM tried to do it with Pontiac tried to do it with the GTO as well. And that was a little bit of a miss and maybe just missed time, but, there's something that came out of, and what's more interesting than all of that to me is how little um, Chrysler has had to change the Challenger and the Charger over yes. the years. Um, there's only, it feels like there's only three iterations of it. So, mm -hmm. right. and they're making profit just straight. Yeah. Back. Yep. Yep. Hey, well, like Kevin had talked about the scat packs. I mean, come <laughs> on, it's like yeah. all that stuff is, is just brilliant marketing, if nothing yeah. else. So, any right. any vehicle they can stuff that Hellcat in. This, That's this what they're doing. Exactly. <laughs> yep, you got it on the on the uh, Durango and and yeah. everything else. So, yep. all right, I'm last close. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, my boy's in a picture of the TRX. I think it is a yeah. hundred thousand yeah. dollars. I'm like, you ain't gonna get one for less than hundred thousand right, <laughs> right now. Mm. So, last <laughs> quick round before we close. I just want to close, Kevin. We'll start with you, then Dwayne, then Aaron. Then I'll, I'll just throw mine in. Right now, if if you were looking on whatever car site for a car, I don't care what it is. It can be just a, a grocery getter, daily beater. What car are you kind of looking for? Oh, man. You know what? Right now, I will probably a uh, new or used. It, uh, no, I'm, I'm saying Does you. Yeah, I'm, any car, any car. Because we all probably any got our eye on no, I mean, and it's not, it's not a wish list either. I'll start with mine just so y'all see where I'm going. It's not a wish list. I'm looking okay. for a Prelude replacement so or an MDX replacement. So I'm either looking at a Mustang. I want to get like a 2016 Mustang. I really, but the prices went up. I'm looking at, I would love to get like a 2012, 2013 Boss 302 because both of those okay. are around the same price. Or if I get an MDX replacement, I'm looking at probably something like a Subaru Outback. And when I say, y'all know I don't buy new cars, so it'll probably be, the Outback would be like a 2012. Exactly. So that's what I mean, anything like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say I'm looking for a Prelude replacement. I Right now, not to down the Prelude, but getting old, man, is in and out of this getting car. Low, it's like, uh... I'll set up, I'll be happy with a bus ticket. <laughs> a bus... <laughs> but no, seriously, I mean, Anything that's got a little bit more room for for me. So at this point, I'm not really picky. If I can find something affordable in my price range, I'm going to jump on it. it is, I don't care if it's a Honda, Toyota, an old Chevy, old Ford. You know, that's where I'm at right now. All right. What about you, Dwayne? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, so, you know, I mentioned when we started out that I've got the, um, the Fiat Spider. It, I'm very happy with it. The only thing it does just doesn't have a lot of get up and go. Like it's not slow, but it's not like it's not. I'm not gonna get you know. I get the teenagers that want to roll up to me all the time. It's like <laughs> I'm not gonna even embarrass it's myself, and I'll just let you. That's yeah, the so, yeah, and so it's, it's like right, exactly. <laughs> and so exactly. And so um, if I had to say, you know, I've mentioned it several times here big fan of uh, the Mazdas and um, if I, I'm very eager to see what this CX-50 is going to be they like I hope they did I just I'm hoping they don't disappoint me but based on what I've seen so far I think that without even having looked at it I think that could end up being like on a, a, a high list like right out of the gate if mm -hmm. they do all the right things that they know that they should do <laughs> All right, Mazda lover. What about you, Aaron? <laughs> I want me a truck, man. 
Want me a truck? Yep. Good old American. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I've been wanting me a truck for a while now. You know, it's just not the right time. And, you know, priorities first. You know, mm -hmm. you know, trucks have kind of become the, the, the big old cars of the old 60s and 70s. Now it's the, the big trucks taking the place. But I mean, I'm just, I just want one. I like it sitting up high on the road. <laughs> You know the utility of it. I mean, the crew cab. You you pretty much got more space than you got in a in a car. You know, with kids and everything. You know, it's it's just all around. And and you know, um, I think every man should have a truck. <laughs> any, partic any particular brand? Any particular? Which one are you looking at? Or any I truck? I think we both know, Devin, what I'm talking about, man. I know you ain't rolling in no Nissan Titan. <laughs> <laughs> no Ram, man. Ram, Ram. <laughs> I got I'll you. End it with putting this back on for you then. <laughs> and it would even not even not even a new model. I like I like the older I like some of the older ones too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just want a, want a truck, man. Cool. And I, they would have I've needed one like for a while. Like I, I went a, a TV went out on me a couple weeks ago. I had to, you know, last minute run to Walmart and get a TV. And the one I saw online wasn't the one they didn't have it in stock there, so I ended up getting another one. But it was a little bigger than the one I was going to get. So I get to the car, get it in the car, and I'm out there for 10, 15 minutes. Trying to, so ultimately, I had to take it out of the box, take it all the way out of the box, and sit it on the seat and leave the box there in the Walmart uh, with the Walmart guy to, so I can get it home. I was like, So I'm going to I'm I'm tell you a little time, secret. Uh -huh. do, you, do you have Menards near you? Do they have those out in Virginia? Uh, Menards, uh, I know they don't have them out in Arizona, but Menards rents pickup trucks and they usually have a pretty good fleet of them. Oh, really? It is, um, I have for probably five years more. If I need a pickup truck, I'm going to go to Menards. They, they did something recently where the pricing is a little bit off, but still like dollar for dollar. If you are in a pinch and you need a pickup now, again, if you don't have a Menards, this is kind of a moot story, but they, they do a phenomenal job of their uh, pickup rental. And there's only one time in probably as many years, in like five or six years, that mm -hmm. they didn't have one available when I went to get it. Um, one of the best kept uh, secrets out there for, and you don't have to buy anything from them. So okay. I've done it too. It doesn't work. It's not cost effective after about two or three hours. Right. But other than that, it's, it's, it's so a like good deal. So anyway. Rental. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I you gotta get. Oh. Yeah, one other time I'm I'm at the Home oh, Depot. No. With... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm saying it was. It was a... truck. Who does? <laughs> you haul for twenty bucks. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I know, right? Yep. You haul is another good one. <laughs> but but it's funny that but it's just like little things. I was at the, I was at Home Depot with you know my ex you know not long ago and picking up something and we get out to the car, you know, and I'm struggling trying to get in the car. And, I, and a, a guy was leaving. He's like, well, why don't you just leave it here and go home and get your truck? And he said it so matter of factly, like, I got a truck at home. <laughs> no, I don't have a truck. Man, why you gonna stay in front of my girl? You know? <laughs> if I had a truck, I would have brought it to Home Depot with me. Who the car to Home Depot? The part you ain't telling us is that I was actually your woman until he put you on front street and said you didn't have a truck and then y'all broke yeah, Exactly, that's what made it the ex, huh? <laughs> That's hilarious. I'll be struggling, but as he said, why you want to get here and then you go home and get the truck. Yeah. All I'm gonna say is Ram need to hit you up to remake that commercial right yes. now. Exactly. I'm speaking the, the same commercial. thing. <laughs> I don't want no man with no truck. And then you know, <laughs> yeah. I know y'all we ended. Huh? What about you? You said you could replace your MDX in the and yeah, yeah. the but Subaru, I'm looking if I can get an Outback because I really, you know, out here in Arizona hitting the trails, I would love to have an Outback or a Subi. Uh, Impreza just sit too low. Crosstrek sits too low for me. And with the Prelude, I mean, I love taking my twisties. And the only thing that I think I really would enjoy driving, uh, my son had the Z. It's nice, it's quicker, but, you know, it's, eh, yeah, it's too small. And I, I think I, it's time for me to have a Mustang one more time in my life. I just can't afford yeah. one. So I I, that's that's what's gonna make me man. Yeah, well, well that that having it that week when I was out there a few, about a month <laughs> ago, it it definitely changed my mind. I'm still always at the core a GM guy, but um, you know you get like it was a nice car. Um, yeah. the, yep. and the drive modes were yep. great. Um, that was one of the other things I was really impressed with is there were at least two of them that were equally as fun as what the other. So. 
And and that's the thing with the used car market. I was looking, Mustang prices are up, even on older ones. I'm talking anywhere from 20 to 30%. Yeah. Going back to like into the 2000s, looking at like a 06, that body style. My son picked one up a few months back and it's already, prices are climbing. So it's going to be a while, but... On that, y'all, we, we we definitely filled up our time. I thank y'all, brothers. Yeah. Again. I thank everybody out there for tuning in, checking out the show. Again, we brothers doing some car talk, some car reviews. We're yes. going to do this all the time on the show. Uh, and we always going to have something hot to talk about because y'all just don't know we didn't even get to have the stuff on our list. But I knew we I, would anyway. <laughs> but I, I knew we'd have enough to ping pong around. And yes. that out well. So, brothers, enjoy it. Always appreciate y'all knowledge and dropping it because, uh, you know, again, black male voices, I think, are kind of the hidden thing, especially in this auto industry. Because one thing I know, every black man has a story about a car, whether he's yes. a car guy, or whether he's not. And so yeah. I want to keep that tradition going. So on that note, fellas, definitely. Oh, I guess I'm, as a YouTuber, I still got to always say this stuff. Y'all better like and subscribe. Like and subscribe for some more. Like hit that subscribe. like button. What do they say? Hit the bell. Bang the yeah. bell. Whatever. We want to so you, hey, hit the bell. We're gonna be talking about black masculinity. We're gonna and black masculinity car ownership. You heard Aaron say you gotta have a truck. So yeah. I mean, this still fits into that. And and we're gonna still kick it about relationships, cars, and educating our children. So I'm gonna close it out on that, fellas. Thank y'all, brothers. Thank y'all. And until next time, peace. Yep. All right. Peace.